I had a football coach back in high school who told us a story that freaked us all out. He had a coaching job at a small college in Montana back in the 80s when he was newly married. One evening after practice, he was making the long commute home, and part of the route he drove along was a desolate stretch of road with open fields on one side and woods on the other. He was driving along when he saw a hitchhiker on the side of the road. This being back in the day in a small town in Montana, my teacher pulled over and let the guy in without giving it a second thought. He said the man was wearing an old, outdated suit and a hat. He looked like something out of the 1940s. The coach thought it was weird that he was so overdressed, it being so hot outside and in the middle of nowhere. The guy got in the car without saying a word. Coach asked him where he was going, but the guy just pointed forward. As they drove along, my coach tried to make small talk, but the guy wouldn't speak or even acknowledge him. He just pulled his hat down like he was sleeping. Then out of nowhere, the guy looks out the window and says, Stop the car. Now. My coach pulled over and the guy got out without even bothering to close the door, and he runs at a dead sprint into the fields until he couldn't be seen anymore. Coach waited there for a while, wondering what the hell that was all about. Then he reached over and closed the passenger door and started to drive again. As he was driving, he looked in the rearview mirror and saw this hitchhiker, on all fours like an animal, running after the car at inhuman speeds. Coach started driving so fast the car was fishtailing, the whole time keeping his eyes glued on the rearview mirror, watching that man chase after the car, on all fours. Eventually, he lost sight of the guy and drove the rest of the way home in safety. When he got home, he told his wife what happened. She thought he was teasing her because a guy at work had told her the very same story that happened to him. She thought they got together to try to scare her. But he swore to her that it happened. And I've met his wife. She confirmed the story. I suggest if you're ever in Montana, avoid lonely stretches of road when you're alone. I live in a small town in rural Australia. I'm a cyclist, and around 6 a.m. one morning, I drove my bike up to the top of the mountain so I could ride around on the trails. On the way up, I passed a woman sitting on the side of the road, in the middle of nowhere. There was no car around, and she had nothing with her like camping gear. I stopped my car, grabbed a bottle of water thinking she may be thirsty, not knowing how long she'd been there, and walked over to see what was going on. As I got closer, I realized she was one of the most gorgeous women I've ever seen. She was maybe 20 years old, had long blonde hair down to her hips, an hourglass figure, and really blue eyes. She was wearing a light summer dress that you'd wear to the beach, and no shoes. This was really weird attire for the middle of the Australian bush, so I'm walking towards her thinking, what the hell? I offer her the bottle of water and ask if she's lost or needs a lift back to town. She just stared at me, like a death stare. She didn't take the water, didn't blink, didn't do anything. I'm thinking, oh man, she is some kind of crazy. So I ask her if she's in trouble, and she just says, no. She still hadn't even blinked yet. I asked if she was waiting for someone to come pick her up. Again, she just said, No. I asked her where her house was, and she said, Here. Now, I was halfway up a mountain, and there were no houses anywhere around there. There was nothing at all. It was just bush. So I was kind of starting to get a creepy feeling about this lady. I was thinking about driving down the mountain far enough to get a cell signal and calling the cops to come and help this chick. So I said, are you sure you don't want me to run you back into town? And she just again says, No. Finally, I said, Look, I don't feel comfortable leaving you out here in the middle of nowhere. Please let me take you to a police station. And with that, she turns around and walks off into the bush, miles away from anywhere, wearing a beach dress and no shoes. I'm standing there like, What the hell? Then I really started to get scared when the bugs and the bird noises started coming back. 
It was only then that I realized I hadn't heard a single sound the entire time I was talking with her. No birds, no crickets, no animals, not even any breeze. Nothing. I hightailed it out of there and called the cops when I reached the bottom of the mountain. I told them that I saw a woman up in the mountain who refused to get in my car. Then I realized how that sounded and I hung up without giving them my name. To this day, though, I still wonder what the hell that was all about. I have a large forest behind my house, and when I was younger, my friend and I would go camping in them. We were about 14 years old when this happened. One day we were looking for a place to set up camp, and we walked deeper into the forest than usual. We stumbled upon a backfield of someone's property and decided to walk back a little ways from it and set up camp there. As we were setting up the tent, my friend had to relieve himself, so he walked a few hundred yards away and went behind a tree. He had only been gone for a minute when I suddenly heard him screaming and he came running back towards me. He was babbling and not making much sense. He was saying something about Barbie dolls and cat's heads. I couldn't understand what he was talking about, so I told him to just show me. He brought me to a clearing next to the creek, and there I saw dozens of Barbie dolls strung up from the trees about eight feet off the ground with severed cat's heads on them. As in, the Barbie heads had been yanked off and replaced with bloody cat heads. Not old bones found somewhere, but freshly decapitated cat heads. The doll bodies appeared to be dipped in red paint, too. I know it wasn't blood because blood doesn't stick to plastic or stay that thick, but I can't say for sure what it really was. I just think it was red paint. I started backing up out of shock when I heard my friend scream again. He had literally just tripped and fallen into a huge pile of cat remains with all the Barbie heads thrown in on top of them. We both vomited, then quickly went to pack up our stuff and go home. We decided not to tell our parents about it, figuring that if we did, our parents would never let us leave the yard again, much less let us go camping by ourselves. But the story isn't over yet. The neighbor whose field we stumbled into? They were friends with my mom, and they started telling her about a bunch of barn cats that had suddenly gone missing, but they figured coyotes were getting them. Then two of their goats went missing from a fenced-in enclosure, and coyotes can't open and shut a gate after slaughtering the goats. Plus, if it was a coyote, there would have been some leftover body parts because they don't consume the entire goat, but no remains were ever found. Then one night the neighbor's husband heard someone out in the yard, he looked out and saw a guy roaming around in the cow pasture. They sort of connected the dots and realized that someone was stealing their animals. So the husband went into 24-7 armed security mode. A week or so later, he saw the same guy go into the barn and he called the cops. It turned out to be the 16-year-old kid that lived on the other side of the property. The kid admitted to stealing the cats and the goat and trying to take a cow. The neighbor said, Okay, fair enough. Just return them. No harm, no foul. But they realized that the kid lived in a mobile home, and there was nowhere to keep the animals he'd been stealing. They talked to his dad, and he told the police that he knew his son was taking the animals, slaughtering them, and taking them in the woods and doing, quote, weird stuff with the bodies and some dolls. The Barbie dolls? He stole them from his little sister. It wasn't until a year or so later that my mom told me this. It was then that I broke down and told her what happened with me and my friends stumbling upon his killing grounds a year before. The kid was charged with animal cruelty and his family moved away not long after that. I really don't know what happened with him or where he is now. My friend and I were walking our dogs near where an old sanatorium used to be, in a wooded area on the edge of town. The place creeps me out, but my dog Susie Q always wants to take this certain path, but it's usually swampy so I would never let her. But one day in the fall things had dried up so I let her take the path and I just followed her. 
we found bed sheets made into a noose hanging from a tree. It looked really creepy, so I took a picture of it. Underneath there was also a rotting mattress and garbage strewn everywhere. It gave me a very weird vibe and I did not like it at all. Fast forward to the following summer. Again, my friend and I were walking our dogs in that same place when we came across that path where Susie Q always wanted to go. Both of the dogs went running off after a rabbit towards the sanatorium. It was then that I heard the voices. One of the voices was that of an old man, maybe 60 years old or so, and he was with two young girls about 10 years old, and they were walking deeper and deeper into the woods towards the place where we saw the noose and the mattress. I stopped and wondered if I should do something. It all just felt wrong. My friend told me to forget it and kept walking. As I stood there wrestling with my conscience and wondering if I should call the cops because it seemed inappropriate, I heard rustling noises in the bushes behind me. Turning around, I saw a young girl of about 11 or 12. She had a lot of freckles and stringy red hair that hung down to her shoulders. Her head was down and she was staring up at me through her bangs. She was wearing a red striped t-shirt, jeans, and tennis shoes. Her hands hung limp at her side with both fists balled up. And it was then that I noticed that she was holding a large hunting knife in her right hand. She started slowly walking towards me with this really weird look on her face, not saying anything. I thought to myself, Good Lord, am I going to have to fight a little girl with a freaking knife in her hand? Just then the two dogs came bounding back and the little girl started stepping backwards into the bushes without taking her eyes off me until she disappeared into the foliage. I moved rather quickly and ran to catch up with my friend and told him what happened. He agreed that it was pretty friggin' weird and we got the heck out of there. I still think about that day and wonder what the hell was going on. I did a little research and I can't tell if what I came across was a wendigo, a skinwalker, or perhaps something else entirely, but the two encounters I had with this creature were the scariest of my life. I live about an hour outside of Seattle in the mountains of a small logging town. My neighborhood is tucked away in the woods with the river running through most people's backyards. My first encounter with this creature was in February 2019, around 10 p.m. I was walking my dog up the thin, curvy stretch of road in my neighborhood. Around one of the sharp turns, not even half a mile into my walk, my dog slowed down and went on high alert. He focused in on a dark patch of pine trees on a fenced-in property in the neighborhood. I tried to see what he was staring at and scanned the tree line. I looked, and sitting in the shadows, I saw an eerily human-looking figure standing under the trees in front of the fence. An overwhelming sense of dread washed over me. Everything felt wrong, like I was in a horror movie or something. All I remember was making a run for it with my dog running after me. What I saw was not a bear, not a wolf, or a coyote, or a mountain lion, and it sure as hell wasn't human. Whatever it was, was on all fours, with its elbows poking out from the sides. Its ribs were protruding, it had long bony fingers, and the spiky spine poking out from its back, with pale skin. And it had no ears or hair that I could discern. And I clearly remember its eyes. They looked both human and inhuman at the same time. My second encounter with this creature was a few months later. I was going on another walk, but this time without my dog. It took a while before I felt comfortable going outside at night at all. My walk was great at first. I started walking around the corner, just up the hill from where I had seen the creature the first time. Suddenly, I heard a woman scream, and I stopped dead in my tracks. The scream sounded strange. I don't really know how to explain it. The scream was shortly followed by non-stop crying. It sounded like it was coming from the tree line up the road ahead. I got that weird feeling of dread again. I tried not to freak out and focused on my breathing and running up the hill. The crying sound slowly dissipated as I ran away, but I started to panic because, frankly, I'm not in the best shape, so running uphill that fast quickly tired me out. 
Soon the crying had completely stopped, but then I heard something following me along the tree line, going tree to tree. I was terrified because I just couldn't run anymore. My stamina is completely garbage and I needed a moment to breathe. But that didn't last for very long because I really felt that that thing was stalking me. By the time I was able to start running again, it sounded like it was right behind me. I heard its footsteps, but I didn't dare turn around to see what it was. Anyway, I'm sorry for rambling, but I've wanted to share this story for so long and maybe even figure out what that creature might be. Even though it scared me, I'm not sure that it really meant me any harm. It could have hurt me at any time, but it never did. Any ideas what it was? I go hiking and camping a lot in the Blue Mountains of Australia and have done so since I was a kid with my dad. Sometimes I go alone, and yes, there is an added risk as a woman alone, but I carry a couple of knives on me at all times, and I always bring a satellite phone along. Anyway, about five years ago, I thought it would be a good idea to camp overnight by myself. Bad idea. The walk was fine. I passed three or four groups of people going the other way in the first day. Then when it got a little more isolated, I picked out an area for my overnight stay towards dusk. I cut a few ferns back and set up my one-person tent. I was maybe 30 meters off the trail, tucked away behind some trees. I heard the usual noises of wildlife as I was drifting off to sleep. Although there was one strange noise... I can only describe it as sounding like somebody was sprinting through the bushes right past me, but it was going way too fast with too few steps to carry a person that distance. Also, if you've ever been in the bush in this part of Australia, you'd know that there isn't a lot of space to walk freely when you're off the trail. You have to wade through a bunch of ferns and bushes, so you can't exactly sprint at full speed without running into things. So the sound made me a bit uneasy but I told myself that it was just stuff falling from the trees or whatever. The next morning I ate, packed up my things, and kept walking along the trail. I passed a couple of people going the other way again. Then I was alone for about half an hour. That's when I heard the sound of a stick being broken, like somebody was stepping on it. The sound came from behind me and to my left, away from the trail. I turned around to look and nearly passed out. A fair distance into the bush was something huge standing there looking at me. I wanted to believe that it was a person, but clearly it wasn't. I can't exactly judge the height, but it was very tall, maybe nine feet. Its skin was dark gray or brown, and it had a horrifically large head with huge black eyes. I couldn't see the mouth or anything, but its arms and legs were really long. I almost started crying tears were welling up in my eyes. I was completely frozen, just staring at the creature. It was like my legs were locked in position. The fear built up in me until I sprinted away along the trail. I ran and ran, too scared to look behind me. I didn't stop until I caught up with some people who were going the same direction as me. They took one look at me and asked, Oh my God, are you all right? I was barely able to breathe from running so hard for so long. I told him what I saw in the bushes and asked if I could walk with them the rest of the way. It took me about six months to get over it, but I did eventually start hiking again. But I don't go alone these days. You couldn't pay me enough to do that. My girlfriend and I went camping once in Golden Ears Park in Canada. We seemed to be the only campers there for the weekend, but as we walked through the park to take in our surroundings, we noticed a campsite that was fully stocked with a tent, coolers, camping chairs, the works. It was so perfect that it looked like a photo set from a magazine shoot, but no one was around. We figured they just went off to grab some supplies and thought nothing more of it. But after a couple of days with no activity at that campsite, we went over to investigate further. What we came across next was something super strange. 
The coolers were full of rotting food and rusty knives. The tent looked pristine, until you got close enough to smell it. There was a lingering stench of urine, rotten food, and mold. We checked it out to make sure no one was inside, but no one was. All we found inside were a bunch of empty cat food tins scattered on moldy blankets and a large amount of name-brand expensive clothing and shoes. Stuffed inside of duffel bags was really expensive makeup and broken mirrors, and there were broken wine bottles and cigarette butts scattered throughout the entire tent. We also found crack pipes. There was a cell phone with texts written in Japanese and several iPods. But the strangest thing was a journal written by a girl who was from out of town talking about a guy she was with and how sleeping with him for the first time was amazing and how she wishes he would never leave her, even though she had a lot of men pursuing her. She talked about how they fought a lot and got evicted and how they needed this camping trip to figure things out. The last page of the journal was about them having a fight and how he was done with her and told her that she was going to get what she deserved. That was followed by page after page full of random guys' names and telephone numbers. The date on that final journal entry was dated from one day before we arrived, and on their camping receipt hanging outside their tent, it said that they paid up for the next week. The campsite looked like two people packed up everything they owned in this world and then just abandoned everything inside a very expensive tent. I'm not sure what went down there, but even when we left six days later, it still remained empty and untouched. I went canoeing in the boundary waters of Minnesota and Canada with some friends. Now, these aren't your normal backyard ponds. The boundary waters are pretty remote and made up of thousands of enormous lakes interconnected with one another. This place is so remote you can't get cell service up there, so we had a satellite phone along to call a helicopter when we needed to be picked up. We had been there for about a week and didn't really have an itinerary. We just planned a boat, camp, fish, and live off the land for a couple of weeks. We left our campsite to canoe one lake over, but while we were out, a storm blew in and the waves of the lake swelled up to two feet high. That was far too much for our little canoe to take, so we pulled off at a random clearing along the shore and set up camp in a hurry to avoid being totally thrashed by the rainstorm and hunkered down for the night. By the next morning, things had cleared up. We started walking up the coast of the lake about 200 feet from our camp, looking for a good fishing spot. But what we found was another campsite. However, it was absolutely trashed. Garbage had been thrown everywhere, tents had been collapsed and torn up, and the clothes were all over the ground. At first we were like, who did this, and why did they leave all their stuff out for the bears to get? But the more we looked around, the weirder it got. For one thing, their trash was still hoisted into a tree to keep it safe from the bears, but the whole bag had been ripped open, despite it being 40 feet in the air. Second, literally everything was still at the campsite. Clothes, backpacks, food, pots, pans, and some seriously expensive hiking equipment. Enough for two or three people. Half of it had been trashed and torn open, and the other half was totally untouched, but tossed around on the ground. Like somebody noped it the hell out of there fast, wearing nothing but the clothes on their backs, and ditching thousands of dollars worth of gear in the process. We waited a couple of hours to see if anybody came back. When they didn't, we called our helicopter crew to report it. But they said they weren't aware of anybody else even being in the area, nor had they gotten any distress calls for help. We eventually left everything there and moved camp. Everyone was pretty upset by the whole thing, and a day or two later, we ended our trip early because it seemed like nobody really wanted to be there anymore. It really was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. My first thought was a bear attack, but all the food was left uneaten. And I've seen bear attacks on camps before. This looked nothing like it. Bears rip packs apart and go after the food, and they're pretty easy to scare away. The question that still sticks in my mind, why were all their clothes and packs still there? half being totally destroyed and the other half left untouched. I still don't get that. 
I've done a lot of camping and hiking all around the country, and I have never had anything as weird as that happen to me before, or since. I once led a group on a trip to the top of Mount Stringer in North Carolina. It's a tough climb to get to the top, about six miles off the nearest road. I was leading a group of eight middle school kids and had one co-instructor along with me. We were camping on top of the mountain and it was a beautiful night with a full moon. The kids and the other instructor went to bed in their tents, but I chose to stay outside in the hammock instead. Around 10.30 p.m. I settled in for the night. Everything around me was rather bright from the full moon, and from the position I was in, I could see down the trail that we had hiked up. As I lay there enjoying the scenery, I noticed something moving on the trail. Bears are common in that area, so I perked up, but as it got closer, I could tell it was a person. Now we were in the middle of nowhere, at night, and here was this guy hiking up a trail with no flashlight, nor any gear. I just froze watching this person move closer to our camp. He arrived at the top of the mountain, and he appeared to survey our camp. He stood there for what seemed like about 30 minutes, then he sat down under a tree facing us. Since he was sitting up, I knew he wasn't trying to go to sleep. He just sat there staring at the camp. I had no idea what to do. I decided to try and wait it out, just staring at this man while he stared at our camp. This went on until about 3.30 a.m. Then he stood up, took a moment to survey us one last time, and went back down the trail that he had come up. At 3.30 in the morning, in the dark, with no camping gear and no flashlight. To this day, I have no idea what that was all about, but it freaked me out. I was paranoid that we were being followed for the rest of the trip, but I never saw him again. I've spent a lot of time backpacking and camping throughout the U.S., and I've seen some pretty strange things. My brother and I came across a tiny, rundown town in New Mexico that seemed to have only one person living in it. We based that assumption on the fact that there were still some food and supplies there that were maybe a few days old and only enough for one person. We spent a couple of days there trying to find this person, just to find out why they were staying in this town all alone but we never found anyone or any living thing. What we did find was a bunch of skeletal remains of a number of deer ensnared in the barbed wire fence and a few of their skulls were impaled on fence posts. We also found a mannequin hanging from a tree, literally out in the middle of the woods. No reason for it as far as we could tell. Finally, we came across a dead junkie at another location. He had obviously OD'd because he still had his arm tied off and a needle in his hand. You just never know what you'll find when camping. My name is Luke and I'm now 20 years old. This story happened to me when I was 17 and it still gives me chills to this day. In May of 2017, I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I started getting bored just cruising the streets, and I wanted to try out some trails in the woods. I had never been to Lee Woods before, so I decided to try it, but I don't think I'll ever be going back again, at least not alone. I was biking along the trail, and I came to a fork in the road. If I took one direction, it would lead to an easier trail, and the other would lead to a harder trail. I decided to take the harder trail. As I went along, I began having a weird sort of vision thing. It looked and felt like I was being swallowed up by the woods. Everything seemed to get bigger and further away, and I got lost on the trail and time stood still. Now bear in mind, I'm a very observant person, and I'm always aware of my surroundings. And I was aware of my surroundings before I got on that trail. But everything changed as soon as I entered it. 
Going against my gut feeling that told me to turn back, I went deeper into the woods, and I came to a point on the trail that was getting dangerous. It was too bumpy to walk down, let alone ride a bike, so I finally did have to turn back. But for a few minutes before turning back, I don't know why, but I just stood still, staring down the trail. I felt like I was being watched from all angles, even though it would be nearly impossible to have eyes surrounding me in that area. I got nervous and began walking back up the hill pushing my bike as I was too tired to ride uphill at that point. That same weird loss of time thing happened again. It felt as if the entire path stretched out by an extra half a mile, like the woods itself was alive and moving. I still had that feeling of being watched, but this time it felt sinister, as if something was about to happen. Bear in mind I hadn't seen a single person at that point, I was all alone on the trail. It's a long path with a steep hill to my left and a very narrow river on my right, and it's maybe four feet deep and four feet wide, with bushes and trees on either side. As I made my way up the ever-inclining path, I heard a woman crying behind a tree up ahead. I slowed down my pace to try to get a look behind the tree before I got to it, the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why would someone jump across the river just to cry behind a tree? So I walked a bit closer to see if the woman was okay, because unfortunately a lot of people do come to Lee Woods to commit suicide. I was hoping to maybe save a life, but you guessed it, there was no one behind the tree, and the crying stopped as soon as I saw that. A bit weirded out, I just slowly turned away and started walking again but at a little quicker pace, as I was pretty unnerved at that time. I've had paranormal experiences before, but usually not in the woods and not alone, so this was all new to me. I had only walked a couple of meters when the crying started again, but this time it was on the opposite side of the river. I didn't bother looking back, I just began jogging to get the hell out of there faster. That's when I heard something walking in the bushes as if whatever it was, was following me. I tried to speed up even more, and the crying became louder and more hysterical. This totally freaked me out, so to get out of there even faster, I hopped on my bike, but I came to a sudden halt and got thrown off. The back tire of my bike, which had just been fine moments before, had gone completely flat, so I had no choice but to get off and push it uphill. After what felt like an hour, but was in reality probably five to ten minutes, I could see the car park. As soon as I saw it, the crying stopped again, and the sound of whatever was following me went away. Then I noticed that the bike was pushing smoother, so I took a look. The tire that had just been flat was now perfectly fine. It had fixed itself all on its own. I jumped on my bike and got the hell away from Lee Woods as fast as I could, and I have not gone back since. Lee Woods is no joke. I found out later that there are a lot of stories of hauntings there. 